is CGTN, China Global Television Network. On today's World Inside, Quick aid amid disasters and conflicts, the enduring mission of the International Committee of the Red Cross, or ICRC. How well has the ICRC managed to carry out its role after years of the pandemic, extreme weather disasters, and drawn out violent conflicts? Direct answers in a one-on-one -on -one with ICRC President Mirjana Spoljaric Egger. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. In the world prone to conflicts and disasters, it's all the more urgent for all to come together in easing the pain and suffering of people caught in the crossfire under the banner of the Geneva Convention. One of the organizations committed to this mission is the International Committee of the Red Cross, or ICRC. Over the past 160 years, the ICRC has been dedicated to providing emergency aid for conflict victims. It has been calling for governments to adapt international humanitarian laws to improve the victims' circumstances. Chinese President Xi Jinping spoke highly of these efforts in his recent meeting with ICRC President Miriana Spolaravish in Beijing. Spola Ravish said the ICRC highly appreciates China's contributions to the international humanitarian cause. And here is my in-depth conversation with the ICRC president during her visit to China. Madam President, good to see you. Thank you. While you are having a very successful trip in China, you met both with Chinese leadership and also with uh, critical voices from different walks of life. Tell me about your takeaway for this trip. First of all, I'm very happy to have come to China. I've had a series of very good, very productive meetings and they are all leading to a strengthening of the cooperation between China and the ICRC that I'm looking forward to. I've met many leaders of institutions that are committed to supporting humanitarian assistance in the future through the ICRC. And you know our humanitarian assistance is neutral, independent, and impartial. And this is the space that we need to protect in the future. Mm. What I found in China is a strong alignment with this idea and with these principles. And, and the strong willingness also and identification with the mandate of uh, the ICRC and in you know, willingness to support the ICRC in the future mm -hmm. because we are indeed facing very challenging times. How would you describe this challenging time for ICRC? It is challenging, I must say, um, because we we are facing overlapping crises. It started with the pandemic, but what we also see is a rise of international conflicts, um, you know, that are creating a lot of human and material um, loss, yeah. which we are very concerned about. Um, but then what you also see is the negative impact of climate change. And I can give you an example. You know, you see a number of conflicts re-emerging in the Horn of Africa mm. and, and in, in the Sahel region. There's fighting and there is displacement, but these people have lived in insecurity for a long time. There hasn't been rain, uh, you know, for years that would allow the farmers to produce adequate amounts of food. So what you see is climate change, food insecurity, economic instability, poverty, sometimes extreme poverty, overlapping situations of conflict. So how do you unpack that? How do you address these multiple needs that the people have? International organizations these days is facing another crisis of a budget limit. Now, here is the critical choice you probably have to make every day. That is, 
whether you devote most of the resources to the root causes or you devote most of the resources to deal with some of the hotspot issues that is going on right now. What is your choice? The ICSC is at its core a humanitarian organization. We were created to help people, civilians, men and women and children in situations of armed conflict. Our mandate is to come immediately and to help those who are affected who cannot help themselves and who are protected by international humanitarian law in such situations. We don't have normally the time to think about the root causes. This is the primary role for development agencies. But of course, in, in reality, both have to work at the same time and in parallel. So we, we are mutually supporting each other and mutually informing each other. And when there are situations where no one else can access but the ICSC, because we go further, we go first and we stay longer, mm -hmm. and we go to areas where others cannot reach, then we also have to do things that in different situations and contexts development agency would probably do, mm -hmm. like helping local authorities ensuring access to drinking water for the population. And this is essential, mm -hmm. like working with local hospitals, ensuring that people can still access in essential health services in right. spite of the conflict. And we all know that in conflict situations, the health system is affected very quickly. Mm. You've been already going on 20 field trips since you became the president of ICRC within a very short period of time. So what is your reading of what you saw? How paramount is this challenge that we're talking about? Just if you want to simplify it to the, to the pure basics, what the ICRC needs is access access to people, and this is increasingly challenged. We need to make sure that all parties to, to conflicts, to armed conflicts, respect the basic principles of humanitarian law, and they include giving the ICSC access to the affected populations, giving independent humanitarian actors access to the affected civilian population. For this, we need security guarantees of everybody involved in a conflict. So this is the reason why we talk to all parties to a conflict regularly and all the time to make sure that we have the trust and ability to operate because we are strictly neutral and we apply confidentiality in these dialogues. It is, n it is difficult to always, when we need to have access, to be granted this access. So we appeal on all parties, all the time, especially when there is intensive fighting, to respect humanitarian law and to give us access. Now, another concern that we have is our systematic attacks, not only on civilians, but on critical infrastructure. What you see in situations of armed violence, especially intensive fighting, is again attacks at large scale on water systems, hospitals, schools, this is not something that can happen. This is not allowed. It's against international humanitarian law. So we have to call on states to abide by their obligations and to uphold parties to a conflict to commit to the same principles and rules. Because the laws of the war are the same for everyone. And it's the basic principles that everybody accepts. Now, in order to have access, we also need resources. Mm. And once we have access, we again need resources to be able to support the people because we don't want to have access and not to be able to bring assistance. So what we depend on is that states, the parties to the Geneva Conventions that enshrine international humanitarian law, and this means all the states in the world because they have all ratified these conventions, that they help us financially to do our work. Mm -hmm. The other day I've been talking to some of the uh, leading thinkers and they describe the situation as sometimes the common sense is not that common anymore, unfortunately, these days. 
So what you described just now, Madam President, is actually common sense. Common sense about humanitarian situation, common sense about humanitarian organization, how it works. But when we are in a situation when common sense is not that common anymore, what is the solutions that you and your colleagues are trying at least? I'm glad you're using the term common sense because what what is enshrined in the Geneva Convention is the universal agreement, and again, all the states in the world have ratified the Geneva Conventions, is the universal consensus and agreement that there is a, a core minimum of humanity that we have to preserve at all times. Leave no one behind, don't attack women and children, etc., etc. Treat the war wounded, you know, treat the prisoners of war correctly, preserve civilian dignity in times of conflict, allow for decent burial of, of the deceased, of the you know, people who have lost their lives in a conflict. Now these basic principles are universal. They are not part of any religion, ideology. We all internalize them through our cultures and traditions. At least 160 years. For 160 years, but even beyond that, because 160 years, what happened is they put it on paper. Yeah. You see in the first Geneva Convention. But these, these understandings are much older. They are part of our you know, common way of life, common it human behavior. Yeah. Exactly, common human behavior when the common sense is not that common anymore. So what is the way that you are trying to work out and discuss with your colleagues in order to deal with it? We appeal. I call personally, since I've taken office large, uh, last October, um, I call on states to recommit to making the implementation and the respect for international humanitarian law a foreign policy priority because these principles were put down and ratified to reduce the cost of war, to reduce the human cost and to reduce the human suffering through the loss of material fabric that is necessary to sustain lives. Health, you know, access to water, mm -hmm. access to food, access to livelihoods, these things need to be preserved. I can see your frustration. Of course, you have this very clear principle that you are not going to reveal the details of your frustration to the public. But that makes your job even more challenging because on the one hand, you have to deal with them. On the other hand, you cannot share this information to seek support from others. I've traveled to many situations uh, where we work already. Uh, I went very early to, to, to the Sahel. I went to the Horn of Africa. I traveled to Syria um, after the earthquake earlier this year, where you see a, an earthquake falling on top of mm. 10 years of, of you know, conflict, mm. where people were really in despair because they had you know, already nothing to lose, and then it became even worse. You, you do get frustrated when, when you cannot provide the assistance that is necessary in order to really meet all the needs that the people have. At the same time, the ICSC employs 20,000 people across the globe. We work in 100 situations of conflict, and we deliver assistance. Every day we reach hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Every day we reunite families that have gone separated during a conflict. Every day we inform families about where their loved ones and closest are. Every day we visit detainees and prisoners of war. So international humanitarian law is respected because otherwise we couldn't be doing this work. This is what motivates us, because every day when we don't get access, we also get access. Mm -hmm. And this is what drives our teams in the field, and they carry the burden. Mm -hmm. Those colleagues working every day, you know, and negotiating access and delivering assistance, 
they are the, the colleagues who carry um, the mandate on their shoulder that the ICC was given. There is the issue of attention span in our world today. Whether people just go through their mobile phones trying to look at those short videos which 30 seconds long, or when they are looking at hotspot issues. When new one comes up, people forgot about the old ones or the one that has been still continuing. That's what we are seeing today. So how would you within your organization trying to balance your attention span on all of these popping up issues? It's a very important topic, not only for us at the ICSC, for, for every humanitarian organization, because you know, governments, politicians tend to go where you, as a, as a reporter, um, orient their uh, attention to it. As I said, we work in a hundred situations of conflict and they are never at the same height with um, every conflict in the world. And some of them have lasted for a long time. Our challenge are uh, protracted conflicts. They last for decades. Um, so it's difficult over time to mobilize resources. What we call on states and funders is to provide us with as flexible funding as they can so that we can prioritize internally um, how we help the m you know, most of the people and the people that are urgently dependent on our assistance. We constantly have to do more with less. That is our reality and that is something we adapt to all the time. But we do need flexible funding that will allow us to always in a crisis be able to respond. But unfortunately over the last decades we have seen a decline in flexible funding. So even if the overall funding levels remain high and significant, they don't give us the flexibility always necessarily to act where we need to go immediately. What is the most persuasive way that you can communicate with them? You need a footprint on the ground. You need the trust of the people on the ground. So every time we leave a certain context, it will take time and additional resources to come back. But what we have seen over the recent past is that situations that seem to have calmed down can very quickly re-emerge and produce another humanitarian fallout of very high dimension. A recent example was um, Sudan. Mm. So you see the humanitarian needs there have increased dramatically in just a few days and weeks. We have to assume that the health system in Khartoum has collapsed by 80%. So only 20% of the facilities are still functioning and able to provide the necessary services to the people. It shows you how quickly you can go from a situation that is perceived as stable to a situation of acute humanitarian need. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Some of the hotspot issues that we have seen over the past few decades now are all being complicated by the possible 
geopolitics that could be involved there. How do you read this potential? I mean, this rather tragic potential. We don't comment on politics. What we do, instead of commenting, we need to assess the political situation because we need to measure our own ability to operate. And, and for this, we need a consciousness of what is happening. Now, what we see is a trend towards declining investments in humanitarian assistance internationally, but also international cooperation, because countries are under economic strain because of many things that have happened over the recent years. And that is understandable. Spending is capped, especially in our traditional donor countries. Now, we need to reduce our costs. We need to respond to that, um, to that anticipation. But we also need to inform our donors and potentially new donors mm -hmm and um, you know, important donors in the future, what the fallout will be if we stop investing in humanitarian assistance. But my primary concern is that we forget what the rules of the war are and why they have been created. So uphold international humanitarian law, reduce the costs now, anticipate, invest in peace. We see with some of the major conflicts and hotspot issues today, that has been reaching to such a climax that you never know whether the information is fake or not. Therefore, it's tough, I would assume, for humanitarian organizations like yours to assess the situation, to understand your capabilities of doing something over there, and to also work with both sides of the conflict and even beyond. Information technology and its potential um, bears a lot of good things for humanitarian assistance. We can be become more efficient in the future, of course. Um, digital transformation is also our daily bread, but it bears challenges as well. It, there are many risks attached to it. The ICSC operates on the ground. This is one role that we have. We access people to bring assistance and protection. But we have a second role, and that is uphold respect for international humanitarian law and continue developing mechanisms and normative frameworks to adapt to new developments and to make sure that international humanitarian law always covers the reality that we see on the ground and adequately responds to that. Now, we are speaking to state parties about new conventions that will have to be developed. One important area is the whole dimension of autonomous weapons. Mm -hmm. We cannot allow weapon systems in the future to be controlled by uh, artificial intelligence. There always has to be a human accountability and control over these systems. Similarly, misinformation and disinformation can seriously harm civilians in a situation of armed conflict and put them in more danger, um, similarly to the destruction of critical infrastructure. So we are trying to identify, and are in the process of doing so, measures that states, non-state actors, academic institutions, the private sector, have to take All the stakeholders. and comply with mm -hmm. in order to mitigate the risks for the civilians. But this is paramount project. First of all, we raise awareness. Mm -hmm. That is the first step. And then- You're doing it now. I'm doing it now. I'm doing it often. And I know how urgent it is. And we are systematically present in all the relevant fora informing member states that need to, uh, member states of the United Nations, the need to negotiate these frameworks. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is something that we do. We provide the expertise that member states need in order to be informed. But there is also a, a step between awareness and, um, and normative agreements. Mm -hmm. It is guidelines. It is working with defense systems. It's best practice. It's introducing, training, and informing so that they comply with the law that exists 
without waiting for new normative frameworks. Because the fact is that the current system of international humanitarian law covers the problematic. It's just a question of whether we need to go a step further. But international humanitarian law applies to new technologies as much as to traditional ones. Now let me turn the question to another direction. ICRC's cooperation with China. We have a decade-long cooperation uh, with China and, and the representation here in Beijing that is close to two decades old. Um, and we have, throughout this time, continuously strengthened our dialogue and cooperation. Now, you've addressed the issue of you know, uncertainty, of rising tensions globally. Of, and we know we can measure the rising number of uh, situations of armed conflict. We know that we are under financial stress. So my call on China, my appeal to the Chinese government and leadership is that they support us even more in the future, that we find ways of co cooperating more strongly in the future in, in promoting compliance with international humanitarian law, but then also in, in supporting us in terms of bringing the necessary assistance to the people the resource dimension that I mentioned in the beginning. Mm -hmm. That is essential. And China is a, is a global player. China is a regional player. China is um, enormously mighty when it comes to being able to assist humanitarian action mm -hmm. globally. Mm -hmm. China has been very much into the peacekeeping missions around the world by working with the United Nations. Meanwhile, also, uh, for example, fighting at the public sea against the pirates in cooperation with many other nations. How do you see the world's evolving and the role of China also evolving? Um, how is that likely to work with your call on China, with your cooperation with China? Implementation of international humanitarian law starts at home and starts in peace times. So you have to train defense systems and armed forces, you know, even police forces in, in complying with international humanitarian law. You have to understand the mechanisms to be able to put them in place quickly enough when you have to. So this is something that China does and where we have a dialogue with China and the relevant ministries and authorities um, to promote that implementation in times of peace and at home. Now through that implementation you become a state party that is capable of supporting others in the implementation and in the promotion of uh, international humanitarian law because you have applied it on yourself you know what it means and you know why it is important, you have internalized it. So that cooperation is extremely important for us. My final question for you, Madam President. You are here in this post at a critical time. Also, we have seen rising women leaders in international organizations such as this. How do you see you are coming into this job with your unique qualities? I know you have been working with international organizations for decades for development and also uh, for bringing different voices together. Thank you. The ICSC looks back on 160 years. It's an organization that carries huge responsibilities, um, but also benefits from enormous trust from millions and billions of people across the globe. I'm aware of this responsibility. I will uphold the mandate of the ICSC. I will protect our principles. And I will strive to make sure that we can be as close to the people in need as we can. And in that, being a woman president, I will strive that we always make sure that women and men equally benefit from our assistance and protection and that this protection be delivered equally by women and by men. Thank you so much, Madam President. Hope your trip in China and beyond will be very successful. Thank you. 
That's my in-depth interview with Mirjana Spalteravich, the president of ICRC, during her latest visit to China. With that, we are coming to the end of today's World Insight. On behalf of my team, I'm Tian Wei. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.